Hey. Can everyone hear me? Okay, it's uh, noon. Uh, time to get going. Welcome, everyone, to today's Grand Rounds. It's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Uh, Holly Chen, who is a assistant professor in the Department of Cell, um, um, Cell and Developmental Bio and Integrated Biology, CDIB. And she, she's a new faculty member who just arrived at UAB in the last year. And in fact, that's how I, I met her at one of those new faculty sort of reception things. And like any good seasoned faculty, we, all I saw was, ah, someone who hasn't given us a seminar, so let's put her on the list. Uh, so Holly um, got her bachelor's degree and her PhD from the Chinese University of Hong Kong in biochemistry and her PhD in chemical pathology and uh, in 2012. And then she, it, during that time, her focus was on sort of uh, understanding the linkage between genetic variants and promoter regions and gene expression, but using computational approaches, something that a lot of us in this room and in this department are interested in. And she then pivoted after that and moved, sort of took that training and applied it to things we're going to hear about today in terms of retinal uh, and neurodegeneration and pathology uh, and did a postdoc at the National Eye Institute at the NIH in, and went there in 2016. And over this time frame, she's also, and she'll tell us about her, her work in that context and things that she's establishing here and, and I'm, I know she's looking for collaborations and whatnot. One of the other things that she's sort of developed in her lab is to sort of apply um, patient-induced pluripotent stem cells uh, to sort of understand and develop models, including I think organoids, as, as the title says, to develop model systems to understand the underlying molecular basis of, of the disease, but then use that as a platform to test therapeutics um, as well. So um, we are a nice crowd. Normally, I say that, especially for the, the new time investigator, for the most part. So uh, and that's for everybody out there. Please ask some good questions at the end. And thank you again for coming and, and telling us about your work. Welcome to UAB. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the introduction. OK, great. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to present in the Pathology Grand Rounds. I'm very delighted to have the opportunity to share my research and get some suggestions and feedbacks. So today, I'll be talking about um, how we use pluri patient pluripotent stem cells derived retinal organoids to model retinal theodopathies and, and to evaluate different therapeutic approaches. Um, just to disclose conflict of interest, um, we have a patent filed for the lead compounds and derivatives for treatment of retinal degeneration, and also I'm the co-inventor of the license of the control and patient-induced pluripotent stem cell lines. I'm also the consultant of predictive oncology. Um, based on the name of the company, we know that it has nothing to do with the retinal degeneration for this part. So during my talk today, I'll first give a brief introduction of the retina and retinal celiopathies. Then I'll describe the, our improvement of the organoid culture system and how we determine the developmental stage of the retinal organoids in compared to in vivo human retina. Then I'll be discussing the, the disease-associated phenotype that we identified in patient-induced prepotent stem cell derived retinal organoids and how we, based on those phenotypes, we develop um, drug discovery pipeline for drug candidates to, for treatment purposes. So the retina is a thin layer of tissues at the back of our eyes. So it's part of the central nervous system specialized for vision. As shown in this image of the histology, we can see that the retina is a multi-layer structure consisting of various cell types. So the light signals are captured by the light sensitive photoreceptors, integrated and processed by the interneurons, and transmitted to the brain through the retinal ganglion cells. My research mainly focuses on the photoreceptors because a majority of retinal degeneration are caused by dysfunction or death of photoreceptors. In humans, there are many. There are two types of photoreceptors: the cones and RAF photoreceptors. Majority of them are the RAF photoreceptor, which functions under dim light environment. The rest of them are cone photoreceptors, which are responsible for color perception and um, higher acuity vision. Do you think you, you can could use, wear, maybe use the,
Stop making sure you know that there are some older people in the room. Um. <laughs> the older women, I should like Speaking for ourselves. <laughs> Sorry about that, and thank you for letting me know. Is it better now? No. Oh, I hope I hope does it sound better now? Uh oh. Oh, how about now? Better? As loud as this mic is going to go. Um, so we're going to try and. Yeah, this is not, yeah. I, I Maybe not very well, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. <laughs> See, see if we can do this. If this doesn't work, then we'll get out another one. So I hope it's better. Now. Oh, I can tell a difference now myself. <laughs> Great. Um, so sorry about that. And let's continue. Um, so yeah. So currently, over 250 disease causing genes has been identified for retinal degeneration. And showing this pie chart, we can see up to 20% of these disease-causing genes are associated with the structure or functions of the primary cilium. So um, disorders caused by defects of the primary ciliums are connectively termed as the ciliopathies. And retinal ciliopathies are diagnosed as the um, early onset retinal degeneration, such as retinitis pigmentosa, limber congenital amaurosis, as well as retinal degeneration in a bunch of syndromic disorders. So in retinal ciliopathies, the most striking defects is the degeneration of the licensing photoreceptors. Photoreceptors has a specialized primary cilium called the outer segments. The outer segment actually has the, um, the basic structure of the outer segments is quite similar with uh, primary cilium in all other cell types. So the outer segment stems from the basal body. It has the connecting cilium or transition zone to gate the in and out of molecules to the outer segments and also it has the microtubule backbone called as axonym. And, uh, but the outer segment is specialized because it has tightly packed discs carried with the phototransduction machinery to maximize their capacity to capture the photons. So in my previous lab, during my postdoc training, we are very interested in the molecular mechanisms and therapies of photoreceptor degenerations. And it always puzzled me that uh, why when the primary system doesn't grow, the photoreceptor needs to die. I mean, it, it can just stay there just without any functions or with limited functions. But then um, the, the primary cilium um, has a very important function besides the capture photons. And they also have a function to modulate diverse signal pathways in various cell types. And this is, could be the reason why when the primary cilium is not functional, the photoreceptor dies. So, um, so our hypothesis is that the loss of the outer segment disrupts the intracellular pathways and results in photoreceptor cell death. And restoration of these frequent pathways could maintain photoreceptor survival. So, um, so to test our hypothesis and to investigate the mechanisms and evaluate different therapies, we used a patient pluripotent stem cell derived retinal organoids because a lot of animal models carrying patient mutations, they don't have the disease associated phenotypes in animal models. And also the retina has very limited cell numbers. So it makes the study mechanisms and evaluate therapies very difficult, particularly if we want to develop some high throughput drug discovery. And so also the primary culture of the retina is very difficult to be maintained in vitro. That's the reason why we try to take advantage of the pluripotent stem cell derived organ culture system for these purposes. So in my following talk, I will be discussing how we try, how we establish a I will describe the system and how we use molecular approaches to determine how mature those organ culture systems compared to in vivo retina. So human pluripotent stem cells are, um, uh, includes embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells. Embryonic stem cells is obtained from the blastosis and which may pose some ethical challenges. So research mainly um, is 
So mainly focus on the induced pluripotent stem cell as a more promising and desirable platform. And those pluripotent stem cells can be obtained from the somatic cells by reprogramming of the somatic cell using Fourier Monaco factors and have been extensively applied for disease modeling and gene therapy and drug screening. With the seminal work from Dr. Sasai, pluripotent stem cell can be differentiated into retinal organoids. Um, the cell aggregates can be induced to form the neurosphere with optic vesicles that evaginate from the neurosphere and subsequent invaginate to form the optical structure, closely mimicking in the retinal developments. Neuroretina from in these optic cells has a multi-layer structures with various cell types. And recent advances of the um, differentiation protocol from Dr. Kendall Solis group generate the organoid with a bunch, uh, with a large expression of different photoreceptors. And this photoreceptor has dislike structures, suggesting at least partial maturation of these photoreceptors. So previous one challenge of the organic culture system is the limited differentiation efficiency. So particularly if we want, we will, if we want to generate a large scale to evaluate different set approaches, this could be a problem. So we, gen, we try to increase the differentiation efficiency by applying um, nicotinamide, which is the vitamin B3 derivatives into the organic culture to push the cells to commit neuronal cell fate. We can see that nicotinamide treatment from day zero to day eight or to day 21 can significantly increase the number of retinal organ production in various cell types. Another challenge of the organ culture is the limited, um, mature, the limited uh, maturity of the foot receptors, particularly related to the biogenesis of the outer segments, because if we want to use the outer the organic culture system to model ciliopathy. So first the outer segment had to be grown. So to promote this process, uh, we use the niacin retina, which is a vitamin A derivative. So um, retinal organized system is an isolated system. So without other um, adjacent cell types, but in the vivo retina, vitamin A and derivatives are provided by other cell types to the photoreceptors. Um, so the, uh, the, the retina provided by the other cell type to the photoreceptor is called 11 cis retina. So because 11 cis retina is very light sensitive, so we use 9 cis retina instead, which is the isoform of 11 cis retina, but less light sensitive. So we replace the commonly used or transretinal niacin to 9 cis retina and evaluate how it can improve the photoreceptor differentiation. As shown in these immunostaining images, um, the photoreceptor progenitor cells are shown in red and greens. We can see that the organoid culture with 9 retina have a higher expression of photoreceptors compared to those cultured in or transretinal on the exit, suggesting a favorable effect of the 9 retina in promoting the photoreceptor differentiation in organoid culture. So um, when we use the organic culture system to model link development and diseases, one common question is that how mature this organic is compared to in vivo retina, because it determines how we can use this organized system to model different diseases or different development. So to answer these questions, we use transcriptomic analysis to get the global view of the genes instead of just several markers. So we compare the gene profiles of organoids at different um, differentiation day and the human fetal and adult retina at different, um, different developmental stage. And so this is the open-ended time warping analysis compared to gene profiles between organoids and human fetal and adult retina. And a red color indicate a high correlation. We can see that the um, day, day 200 organoid, which is the end stage of the organoid differentiation, have a similar gene profile with adult retina. So be, um, to get to, because we are trying to use the organoid to model retinal CD offices, then we, pro so we perform immunostaining and transmission electron microscopy to, um, to give more details about the outer segments of photoreceptors. We can see that rhodopsin, which is a phototransduction protein located in the outer segments, goes beyond the base of the um, the outer segment, suggesting the formation of the primary cilium. And transmission electron microscopy reveal more details of the outer segments. And this is the basal body connecting cilium and outer segments with these like structures. Although the outer segments of photoreceptors in the organic culture are not as mature as those in in vivo retina, 
but uh, we can see the primitive formation of these structures, which should enable us to model early stage of retinal ciliopathies. And particularly this, um, this uh, early stage of retinal ciliopathies is desirable because if you want to um, develop some therapeutic interventions, we want to apply the therapeutic intervention at the early stage before any irreversible damage to the photoreceptors. So, um, so we use this organized system to apply this organized system to use to patient induced pluripotent stem cell to model the retinal ciliopathies. This the disease we focus on is septin LCA, which is a severe and early onset retinal ciliopathies. Limber congenital amaurosis LCA is the most severe form of early onset inherited retinal diseases. And septin LCA patients have diff, uh, visual defects in, at birth or at very early stage of life, and severe visual impairment of blindness is observed in early adolescence. And here is uh, the optical coherence to tomographic images showing the different layers of the retina. We can see that the, we particularly focus on the outer nuclear layer because this is the um, where the photoreceptor nuclei are located. We can see that compared to the, control, the normal control, um, septin, septin LCA patients have a much thinner outer nuclear layer, suggesting the foot death of the foot receptors. And here is a table showing the summary of the um, population study of the septin LCA patient. Um, they are at their adolescent stage. We can, and the ERG is an extra retinogram detecting the electrophysiology and functionality of the foot receptors. And scotopic ERG shows the rock photoreceptors and photopic ERG shows the cone photoreceptors. We can see that uh, most of the patients at, at the early adolescent stage, they already have undetectable scotopic and photopic ERG, suggesting functional defects of their photoreceptors at this, er, at this early stage of life. So then we recruited a group of, a family of septic and patients. And this patient consists of uh, uh, an infected control and two patients. We obtained the biopsy samples of the control and patients and um, we generate the fibroblasts and we program the fibroblasts into iPS cells and differentiate the fibro iPS cells into retinal organoids. And then at day 200, we can see that the control have a well-developed outer segment, but these structures are missing in the patients. Then we try to use transmission electron microscopy to look into more details about the defects of outer segments and how it happens. We found that in the control, we can observe very well elongated microtubule structures of, in, of the photoreceptors in the control, um, for, in the control organoids. And a lot of the a lot of the photoreceptors have the ciliary vesicles which carry the building blocks of the outer segments. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I don't know why it is missing. And so, but um, but in a lot of in some a lot of in a substantial friction of the patient photoreceptors, um, these cilia vesicles are missing, and then also the cilia exudates fail to elongate. So based on this phenotype, we're trying to this um, trying to develop an organoid-based drug discovery pipeline to find the uh, small molecule drugs to improve the photoreceptor development and maintain their survival. So current steps, current therapeutic treatments in um, of the septin LCA mainly targets on the most common mutation, and this most common mutation leads to a stop leads to an inclusion of a cryptic exon in carrying a stop codon. So in one approach, um, people use CRISPR-based approach to correct the mutations and remove that so that it restores the normal splicings of the septin LCA. In another approach, they use the antisense oligonucleotide drug to, um, to correct the splicing defects and restore the wild type septin LCA mRNA. And this is the, this QR110 drug is developed by um, researcher in UPAN and is under clinical trial and have been shown to have a long lasting improvement of the vision in septin LCA patients. However, although this is the most common mutation of septin LCA, it only covers up to 21% of septin LCA cases. And or there are a lot of other cases are caused by various mutations. And therefore, uh, we try to concurrently develop um, other therapeutic approaches to um, maintain photoreceptor survival. And here it shows, we shows our um, drug discovery pipeline. 
And as you probably are aware that the patient um, human retinal organoid differentiation takes as many as 200 days. And we can imagine that with such a long differentiation time, it takes a longer time for the phenotype to show up and also takes a longer time for the drug effect to take place. So it does, and so this, Characteristics pose actually pose challenges for high super screening because it means that we need to maintain the culture with the drugs for a pretty long time. So to overcome these obstacles, we try to use mouse retinal organoid, which has a much shorter differentiation time compared compared to human ones, and to do the drug screening and then verify our findings in patient organoids instead. So our primary and secondary assays are performed on mouse retinal organoids, and then we verify the lead compounds in patient retinal organoids and in vivo mouse retina. And then lastly, we use we investigate the mechanisms of action of the lead compounds so that we know what serine pathway is modulated. Because if we know what serine pathways are modulated, then we know that what serine pathway could be implicated in photoreceptor dysfunction or degeneration. So the mouse model of septin anti lc is RD16, which carries an imprint deletion in the mouse intel domain of sept 90 And the RD16 mice phenocopy the rapid photoreceptor degeneration of septin anti lca We can see that the thinner and thinner outer nuclear layer in this RD16 retina. Then we will obtain the wild type and RD16 um, iPS cells from the mice and differentiate the iPS cells into retinal organoids. We can see that the RAFD16 organoids have defects in the raw rod receptor development and the, the also the outer segment development as shown by the markers of rhodopsins and the marker of C-ring exonyms. Because um, for drug discovery, we need the quantitative um, phenotype so that we can really measure what's the efficiency of the drug. So to, do, to identify the quantitative phenotypes, we perform flow analysis of retinal organoids from wild type and RD16 IPSL derived retinal organoids. This organoid carries an NLGFP tag. NL is the full's first post-mitotic marker for Raffold receptors. So the Raffold receptors in this organoid can be shown by the GFP signals. We can see that the RD16 organoids have a lower viability and lower GFP positive raffold receptors at end stage of differentiation, suggesting, def suggesting defects of raffold receptor development in these RD16 organoids. So, so we want to apply this organoid culture, mouse organoid culture system for screening, which we for high super screening for drug discovery, which means if we need a large amount of organoids. And, and again, one of the challenges of the mouse retinal organoid is that the differentiation efficiency is not super high. So we try to apply hypoxia condition at the early stage of differentiation to mimic an early, sorry, to mimic the early stage of in vivo um, retinal, the oxygen level in, in early stage of in vivo retinal development. We can see that there are no significant morphology morphological difference of the retinal organoid differentiated under hypoxia or nomoxia conditions. The preprotonous stem cells are able to form cell aggregates and neurosphere with neuroepithelium. The neuroepithelium subsequently eventually to form the optic vesicles. The optic vesicles would uh, eventually to form the optic cup structures. But we found that hypoxia actually um, significantly increased the percentage of optic vesicles and optical formations in both ES cells and IPS cells, suggesting that hypoxia favored the um, optic cup formation in mouse organoid culture. So then we can, um, this hypoxia um, protocol can enable us to largely produce a lot of mouse organoid for drug screening. And another Challenges related to the organoid for drug screening is that um, each three-dimensional retinal organoid they have a high um, variation, so that and so that we if we want to so that um, so if we just use a single organoid, it's hard to really um, determine whether the effect is come from the variation or the drug, and also because the organoids are kind of big, so we, we cannot use the intact organoid for drug screening because the robot cannot pipette them. It's, it will break the organoid. So we dissociate the three-dimensional organoid into single cells and we perform the screenings in the 2D culture instead. We can see that after dissociation, the 2D culture is able to recapitulate what we observe in the 3D culture. 
And we can find that the RD16 cells have a lower viability and lower GAP positive cells. And based on this phenotype, we screen over 6,000 small molecule drugs at 11 concentrations and to duplicate of each concentration of each compound. And then in the end, we identified the 114 positive hits because a lot of small molecule has an autofluorescence problem. So uh, we performed another screening using the organized without fluorescence marker to remove the autofluorescence hit. And in the end, we selected 14 hits for the secondary assays. So the secondary assay is performed on intact mouse retinal organoids by immunostaining of rhodopsin and esopsin, which are markers for rod and cone foot receptors respectively. We can see that some drugs are able to increase the fluorescence intensity of rhodopsin and or esopsin, suggesting their favorable effect of rod and cone foot receptor development in organoid cultures. Interest and um, so we selected BZO5, which is the most efficient compound as the lead compound for subsequent analysis. And interestingly, BZO1234 actually derivatives of BZO5. And BZO5s are actually called recipient, which is an FDA-approved antihypertension drug. So we continue to verify validate recipient and patient retinal organoids. We can see that um, patient retinal organoid treated with respin have an um, improved or a rough foot receptor development as shown by increased rhodopsin expression in this, this effect is consistent in multiple clones for multiple patients. And we also perform in transmission electron microscopy to look into more details about the outer segment biogenesis. And we, if you remember, if we record and patient um, retinal organoids, the foot receptor has a uh, have missing ciliary vesicles and the ciliary accident failed to elongate. We found that in one patient uh, treated with recipient, they have a higher percentage of ciliary vesicles. And in, an, in both patients, they have an elongated ciliary exilin, suggesting a favorable effect of the recipient in promoting the biogenesis of the outer segments in patient foot receptors. Then we perform, then we continue to verify recipient in in vivo retina by performing intravitreal injection of these drugs into RD16 retina. We can see that um, RD16 retina with the resumin treatment have a thicker outer nuclear layer in which photoreceptors nuclei are located, suggesting that recipient can preserve the can improve the survival of raw photoreceptors. Then we perform electroretinogram to evaluate the functionality of these surviving photoreceptors. And uh, we can see a marginally increase of topic A wave, which um, look into the amplitude of the raw photoreceptors, and significantly increase of the scotopic B wave, which look into the interneurons connecting with the raw photoreceptors, suggesting that the rough the resume treatment can um, functionally improve the raw photoreceptors. Then we continue to investigate the mechanisms of actions of recipient to determine what signaling pathways are modulated by them to get some more hints of the mechanisms of photoreceptor degeneration. Um, what we did is that uh, we compared the gene profiles between untreated and treated patient organoids, and we identified the differential expressed gene. And then we analyzed what signaling pathways are these differential expressed differential express genes are involved in. And here's the summary of our results. And we can see that we, we can see pathways involved in cell survival, cell death, and the cell-cell interactions, metabolisms, and proteosome. Because um, autophagy has been reported to be to be to act as an autophagy inhibitor in neuronal cells. So we start with the proteosome pathway to verify our findings in the transcriptomic analysis. So autophagy is the Slovenian pathway inside the cells to remove excessive or unwanted cellular components or, or proteins. So autophagy is usually triggered by stress, leading to the formation of phagophore, and the cargo adapter P62 binds to the cellular components to be degraded and form the autophagosome. The autophagosome carrying the components to be degraded fills with the lysosome for protein degradation. So to give a preliminary evaluation of the auto autophagy pathways in the, in the organoids, we perform first simple analysis of the cargo adapter P62 and the autophagosome marker LC32, which is the lower band. And we found that in untreated patient organoid, there is a lower expression of P62 and resume treatment is able to increase this level. 
And also we found the accumulation of autophagosomes in this patient organized and recipient is able to help or the, how to clear the accumulated autophagosome. Then we wonder how recipient as autophagy inhibitor is able to clear the, the autophagosome. Then we look into, so that's the reason why we look into ubiquitin proteasome system. Ubiquitin proteasome system and autophagies are two major pathways involved in the proteostasis network. And then so their, their balance is regulated by the common cargo adapter P62. So if one is upregulated, the other one is downregulated to maintain the balance. And first, we first look into the 20S proteasome, the expression of the 20S proteasome level. And we found that it is increased in the untreated patient organized and resume treatment does not downregulate the level of the proteasome. But we found that the resume treatment can significantly increase the activity of the proteasome. This could be the reason why it can help to clear the, auto, the accumulated autophagosome. Then we continue to investigate how the modulation of the proteostasis network can facilitate and improve the biogenesis of the outer segments by Western blood of the key regulators of um, Western blood of the key regulators involved in different different um, different part of the uh, the outer segment biogenesis, including um, CD transport, initiation of CDM biogenesis, and CDM disassembly. And they found two molecules that are significantly different. One is called um, OFD1, which is a distal appendages marker, and in primary CDM biogenesis, um, OFD1 had to be removed for the primary CDM to develop. We can see that there is an increased level of OFD1 in untreated patients, and recipient is able to downregulate that. Another more striking molecule is HDEX6, uh, the histone deacetylase 6, which deacetylates the microtubule. It is a key um, primary CDM disassembly marker, and also because it deacetylates the microtubule, it also impedes the intracellular trafficking. We found there is a significant increase of HX6 in untreated patient organized, and the recipient is able to downregulate the level, suggesting that the it gives some molecular mechanisms of how recipient treatment can improve the um, biogenesis of the outer segment. And uh, we, we also verified these mechanisms, although it is developed, it is found in the patient organ line, we also verified that in the in vivo mouse retina. And here is the summary of the action mechanisms of recipients, and at least in the proteasome pathways. So in untreated patient photoreceptors, um, there is accumulation of autophagosomes and the ciliary vesicle cannot form. So the preciliary vesicle, which is delivered from the intercellular, in, delivered from the um, and the endoplasmic reticulum to the base of the cilium it will be accumulated inside the photoreceptors. And recipient treatment increase the proteasome activity, which helped to clear the auto accumulated auto autophagosome. And also, recipient access the autophagy inhibitor. So it leads to the accumulation of P62, which helped to clear the HDX6, which is the target of P62. And because PHDX6 impedes the intracellular trafficking, so the downregulation of HDX6 can facilitate the trafficking of pre vesicles. So it shows the restoration of proteostasis can rescue the photoreceptors. And also we identify the repurposing small molecule drug that is able to maintain photoreceptor survival. Because recipient is already an FDA-approved drug, so it um, so it's accelerated the transition from bench to best site. And also it is a small molecule drugs and compared to other therapeutic approaches such as gene therapy, small manufacturing of small molecule is less expensive and just could be more favorable by pharmaceutical companies. So um, one future direction is to identify more potent drugs. And before I left my lab and uh, in NEI, uh, I did another small screening, another small scale screening using libraries for consisting of recipient derivative and autophagy modulators. Because we already identified recipient as a lead compound that is efficient, so we collaborate with colleagues in NCAT to modify different branches of recipient to see whether it can generate more potent drugs. And also because we demonstrated that autophagy pathway seems to be implicated in the photoreceptor degeneration, so we also try different autophagy modulators to see whether we can identify more potent drugs. 
And so, uh, so before I left NIH, we did another small scale screening on the intact mouse retina organoids, and the physio one is actually recipient. And we can see some molecules seems to have the potential to have a higher efficiency than recipient in drug in rhodopsin and asopsin staining. Now we are optimizing the concentration to try to find the more potent drugs to be tested in the animal models. And also we can see that the recipient, the sibling molecules modulated by recipient is downstream of the step 90 mutations and has nothing to do with, with the with the outer segment, there this segment pathway could be could be shared by different by retinal degeneration caused by different mutations, and thus the recipe holds the promise to be translated into more generalized treatment targeting uh, multiple retinal degeneration. So to test this hypothesis, we try we collaborate with a company and we test this recipe drugs in p twenty three H rhodopsin degenerative rat models. And this rat, this model has the mutations in the rhodopsin, and so this phototransduction protein cannot be trans cannot be transported to the outer segments and leads to photoreceptor degeneration. And here shows the functional functional assays. Of, from the companies and the scotopic A wave shows the electrophysiology of the rough photoreceptor. The, the B wave shows the interneurons connecting with the rough photoreceptor, and photopic B wave shows the interneuron connect with the cone photoreceptors. We can see that when we look into the mouse, regardless of the sex, there is a trend and um, trend of the improvement of recipient as shown in blue at the late stage of the. The, the development, but and then, but when we isolate the female only, it seems the effect is more dramatic compared to when we group the male and female together, and uh, this could lead to this could be indicated the sex related sex specific effects, or more likely it could be because of the behavioral issues of the male rat. Because I heard that after injection, the male rats tend to be more aggressive and they tend to scrub their eyes and make things even worse. Um, so we are trying to we are now trying to increase the animal the number of the animals to see whether we can get a more um, solid conclusions. But in any case, um, it shows that the recipe seems to also have the can lead to functional improvement of the photoreceptors in an other degenerative model caused by different mutations. And another feature direction is related to serine pathways modulated by recipient, because if we identify what serine pathways are modulated by recipient, it suggests these pathways are implicated by in photoreceptors and uh, in photoreceptor degeneration. And a better understanding of the serine pathway can enable us to design, uh, to understand the mechanisms and also to design more promising therapeutic approaches. And so we are now. This is the focus of my lab. We are now trying to under, to go into more details to into the mechanisms of these signaling pathways. And also it suggests um, there, it is not super clear in these images, uh, but the, it also shows there is some involvement of other cell types in the retina because there is, a, we can see the cell, the tight junctions and also there is some extracellular matrix pathways involved inside. So it's a, it also give us some hints probably photoreceptors do not just die themselves. They are also, there are other supporting cell types in the retina that, co that cooperate in this process. So before I stop, I'd like to thank uh, people who have contributed significantly to this project, particularly my mentor, Dr. Anand Swarup in NEI. And uh, Hiroko established the um, organoid culture system inside the lab, and Samantha established the intravitreal injections. The transcriptomic analysis are mainly performed by Anupam. And I'm also thankful to the Genetic Engineering Core and Flow Cytometry Core of NEI. I, we mainly collaborate with Mandrew in NCAT to perform the small molecule screening. I'm also thankful for colleagues in NHLBI for generation of the induced pluripotent stem cell line of control and patients. The septinitial cell patients are diagnosed by Dr. Samuel Jacobson in UPenn. It is great loss to feel that he passed away early this year. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I'd like to take questions and suggestions. What's the molecular target of a, a recipe in, in, in relation to hypertension? Oh, so I'm talking about specific protein. You know, these come from bicycles. 
So for, for the treatment of hypertension, it is said that it binds to the 5-HT. Yeah. So, no, so you mentioned that uh, you're going to try to uh, identify like a, you know, uh, what's the, uh, more important the animal in this compound. So are you concerned that like, if you get a you know, higher potency, if you treat the kids, Right, you're gonna induce an even lower, uh, like it's it gonna cause a lower hypertension, a uh, uh, lower, uh, uh, you know, for the hypertension. Is that your concern? Uh, so the question is related to concern of the where the more, more potent drug could be have some side effect to the case. Um, so this. This is very reasonable concern and definitely is our concern for the safety of the drugs. But uh, when we use recipient, just by recipient itself to treat the retinal degeneration, we actually use a 10, 10 to 100 fold lower concentration by the use it when it's used for treatment of hypertension. And also um, for treatment of the retinal degeneration, particularly for small molecule drugs, we can actually develop some eye drop instead of using the systemic approach. So, um, this could be that could definitely be a concern, but though um, I think the toxicity of drug related to the concentration and also the administration. So in the, in terms of this, I think recipient is relative could be a relatively safe approach, even it can have a side effect of hypertension. I have a question. Do you, you showed that the, um, the more um, in your uh, higher volume of your organoids in the hypoxia. And higher number. Higher number. So, why do you know the mechanism of that process? And, and, and I ask from a redox biology perspective because you know, a lot of people in this audience are also interested in the effects of high and low oxygen on different cellular functions. Oh, yeah. Um, the question is just related to the mechanisms of hypoxia to improve the um, retinal development. And um, unfortunately, we didn't go into the the, the mechanisms of that because it's just not too much related to the project, but um, uh, so uh, but we just use that we use hypoxia because it's just to simulate the in vivo red oxygen level in in vivo retinal development, and because when we design the organoid culture, it's better that it close the better it will be too close to the in vivo system then, but we didn't look into the mechanisms of that. Thank so you. Think, the recipient is also used to treat schizophrenia as a neurological disease. So I'm wondering whether this recipient can rescue the neuron or other neuron cell deaths besides photoreceptor. Maybe we can induce gain factors and schizophrenia like the hematophagy and then and then also certainly protect other neuron cells from cell death. Yeah, so the question is related to whether resurfing can be also applied to treat other um, neuronal cell deaths. And actually, um, people already tried that, and it largely depends on what's the mechanisms of this neuronal cell death. For example, um, if, if for treatment of Alzheimer's and Parkinson, they already have accumulation of some proteins inside. And so for that case, I think people try that, and it seems that recipient actually um, accelerate the death of the neuro neurons. Yes, so it really depends on um, how, what, what's, the pro what's the target of resin protein to be degraded? Okay, yeah, uh, um, are you interrupting on the show? Okay, yeah. So is it possible that uh, recipient targets different uh, of effect, uh, the effect on, on different proteins in, in the photo, uh, photo receptor cell. Is it possible? Like a uh, to different proteins. Yeah, uh, so the question is whether it's possible that recipe uh, modulate a different, various different proteins in the photos. Yeah, I think that's definitely possible because if you look at the serine pathways that we more that is modulated by recipe, we can see that it's implicated in different 
it's just a different pathway. Of course, um, so far we didn't really look into whether it was the target of recipient because it's just a little bit complicated and also the signaling pathway. Those signaling pathways are actually intercorrelated with each other. So we cannot even dissect which pathways it only worked on. So, but it is very, it's a very reasonable thought that the recipient target have a multiple targets and the photoreceptors. It's possible, I think it's very important to identify this, this photo. To, to develop better, you know, 